Welcome everybody, George Donnelly here with another uh, Bitcoin Cash Builder interview for BitcoinCash.site. Uh, with me today is Josh Ellithorpe of uh, BCHD and Coinbase. Welcome, Josh. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for the invite, George. Awesome. A real pleasure to have you with us uh, today. So uh, for those who aren't uh, familiar with you and your work, uh, can you just uh, give us a, a quick introduction uh, of you know, what, yeah. what you're up so, to, what you work on? I've been programming since I was a little kid. I currently work at Coinbase as a staff engineer doing crypto integrations for Coinbase. Uh, that included Bitcoin Cash. There's some videos about how I did that implementation uh, with my team, you know, years ago. But uh, as of current, uh, basically adding a lot of other additional assets and support into Coinbase and spend a lot of my time there. In my free time, I work on open source projects, mainly around Bitcoin Cash, uh, Docker images to launch full nodes, as well as supporting BCHD with Chris Pesia. And so we spend a lot of time working on that. We're trying to get the final touches of SLP support. Right now we're at release candidate eight. Uh, I keep finding little nagging bugs that uh, hopefully we can get a release out soon. But the next major release of BCHD will include full SLP support. And that would be NFTs, regular tokens, as well as uh, um, minting batons and all of the advanced functionality. It'll be a fully conformant to the SLP spec. And so that's our main thing that we're working on right now. Awesome. Awesome. So for people who aren't aware, uh, you know, what is BCHD and what will like who would be the prime audience for it that's, and for the you know the new SLP functionality? That's a great question. So right now, uh, BCHD is a fork of BTCD. BTCD was a full node written for Bitcoin in Golang and uh, was actually very well featured and is actually what the Lightning developers were working on uh, for their implementations of Lightning as BTCD was the first to start adding things like Neutrino support that were not supported in Bitcoin Core. So we, uh, Chris Pacio, took a look at the BTC code, the code base, thought it was really interesting. Uh, we wanted to have an environment for Go developers to have a quality API into the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And so he did the initial port of BTCD to BCHD. When I saw that, I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Uh, that resonates with me as a Golang developer. I want to come and help. So I was helping with some of the sync peering, some of our public infrastructure. I, I offer a full node for people to use gRPC requests against um, that I host for free. And then basically helped him extend BCHD as we got feature requests, better integration with Fulcrum, different HTTP handling for the JSON API. But the main focus for BCHD is to have a one-stop shop for Bitcoin Cash developers, merchants, or anyone that needs the uh, a full node and has a much better API to access the data. So what we found is the JSON RPC data that comes back from most full nodes, it's okay, uh, but could have been faster and easier with stronger contracts and type checks. So the gRPC API provides that, it provides streaming APIs instead of zero MQ, you can actually use gRPC streaming, which is far more reliable. And then it also offers, you know, UTXO level lookups and transaction lookups. And so we have um, more indexes than a traditional Bitcoin node. A uh, traditional Bitcoin node will index the uh, transaction state, uh, but we also index, um, you know, provide hooks to get to the UTXOs themselves. And then we also um, have released the first implementation of Neutrino for Bitcoin Cash. So it's the only full node that has Neutrino support. And uh, right now there's still some development. The wallet had never made it to final. It was in beta and there's still a couple of bugs in Neutrino wallet, but it was working for a while. And then Chris got busy and uh, that has gone on the back burner, hopefully to be fixed re relatively soon. I think there'll be probably a, a resurgence of dev on that once we get the SLP work in that we worked on with James Kramer. So right now the SLP integration has all SLP tests passing. So they've done comparison tests to SLP DB and other SLP indexers, and we have not found any inconsistencies in data, which is a really good sign. And uh, we're running a full set of the SLP test suite. 
So we're really excited. Uh, the release has taken a little longer than we wanted it to, but uh, I'd much rather release it at high quality, especially since James Kramer has a release candidate that's available through his channels. So he, people still have access to the work that we're doing. And then when it is actually final, we'll get it mm -hmm. into the mainline BCHD. Cool. Cool. That's so great to see BAC BCHD developing because, I mean, it is a full node uh, like uh, Bitcoin Cash node or Bitcoin Verde or uh, Knuth or Flowey uh, yep. or BCH Unlimited, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's a little bit different because it's, it's written in Golang, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the writing it in Go yeah. presents its own unique, you know, um, hurdles. And we've actually, I really like writing in Go. It's very performant. We get really good primitives for a lot of this stuff. And we also have a BCH util package that makes it really easy for Go developers to have all of the types of objects that they need within their Go uh, development environment. In fact, uh, we use those libraries internally at Coinbase. Uh, so BCH util and BTC util uh, from uh, BTCD. We actually leverage those libraries a lot as we need mature quality libraries to construct transactions, sign transactions, derive addresses, convert addresses, a lot of the common behavior. And um, it's a lot easier for our devs to work with Go or JavaScript or Ruby or a higher level language. Um, and rather than trying to link against the things that Bitcoin Core is doing in, uh, or, you know, uh, BCHN is doing in, um, so, I find it a lot easier. I wish there were more Go developers actually helping us with some of the work that we're doing over there. I find that a lot of the people are working on kind of the C mm -hmm. side of the house, but that doesn't provide the tools that the exchanges mm -hmm. actually need. So I think that a lot of these technical purists, they're like, oh yeah, but it's, you know, Bitcoin D and I'm going to work on my Bitcoin D derivative. And it's like, okay, that's awesome. Um, but where the exchanges are only using the RPC there and it doesn't give the exchanges actual code tools to use. It gives them an API to use, but it doesn't give them the building mm -hmm. blocks for constructing the services that they want to construct. And then people get stuck looking for uh, third party libraries, right? So they're going to look for JavaScript libraries. They're going to look for Python libraries. They're going to look for Ruby libraries or Go libraries or whatever it is. And all of the main brain trust is still working on the C++ implementation. And we constantly see libraries that are only partially supported or they are supported for a while and then they break and then there's nobody really supporting them. And this has been kind of a constant problem. And I think that it's uh, it behooves the developers in the Bitcoin Cash space to really think about the libraries that everybody else needs to use. And I would say that the only other full node that really has thought about libraries and building blocks at the coding level has been Knuth, which I haven't actually used that much. But he has uh, made sure that his full node is fully library accessible in a number of languages. And while I'm not a pro on the tools that he wrote, I think that's really important because we want these stable APIs. People are going to continue to write their own indexers. They're going to be writing their own uh, you know, transaction submission, UTXO selection, all of these things. And the more mature those libraries are, the more they can be reused and the more time is saved by the next generation of developers in the actual products they want to build. Because I don't think anyone is building a product and it's like, I'm building a UTXO selector. No, nobody's building a UTXO selector, mm -hmm. but everyone's building a UTXO selector. And so nobody cares that as an end user to get that, but they want a wallet that works really nicely. So good abstractions around mm. UTXO selection would be a very obvious thing that most people need that strangely enough has no library support. There's very few libraries that are doing quality UTXO selection. Hmm. Okay. Wow, that's a lot of good information. <laughs> that's really interesting. So, um, so one one thing that came to mind uh, when you're talking about you know libraries that enable people to build things is mainnet.cache. Great. What job. do you think of that project? I think it's great. I think that uh, that it satisfies the need for web developers that need a web wallet and good APIs around their web wallet. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that solves one use case. Now, that doesn't really necessarily help someone with um, constructing a wallet from scratch. It allows them to have a drop-in wallet replacement, 
right? And I think there's room for both. Mm -hmm. I think some apps just want a wallet that works, that has good hooks to integrate with it, and they really just don't care as long as it's functional and the UX is decent for their end users. That could be video games that want to do point systems with SLP tokens. That could be a bunch of stuff where the wallet is pretty much invisible and they just need the APIs. Mainnet.cash, fantastic for that kind of stuff. But it is a web wallet. Web wallets present their own security concerns, and it is um, not necessarily something that's easy to embed into a, you know, um, as a first class citizen into a game that wants to do its own wallet infrastructure. So to me, I think that some of the library support around, you know, better notification of when blocks land, those things have been done. But a lot of the independent wallet features, I think, are kind of immature. For instance, I noticed a bug recently. Someone had reported on noise.cash, and some of the developers were like, this is FUD. But it wasn't. It was not. So on noise.cash, people get tips. Hmm. And the average tip size is a cent, right? Maybe two cents. Mm -hmm. And part of that tip Mm -hmm. goes back to the person that did the tip, 20%. So we're talking about some tips that are one-fifth of one cent, right? So the number of bytes those UTXOs take is actually substantial. So some guy had made like $150 on noise, but they were all in like fractional of a cent tips. So he went to go move it and the the fee was very high. And he reported about the fee and people were like, that's FUD. And it's like, no, he tried to craft a transaction with 12,000 UTXOs in it. Not like, (laughs) oh, this is FUD, this is bunk. It's like really legit. Then he hit the next failure, which is a transaction that big is not valid. Only a hundred kilobyte transaction is valid as a maximum transaction limit on Bitcoin Cash for a standard transaction today. So someone jumped mm-hmm. all over him. That's not even possible. You can't even craft a transaction that big and got mad at the user that legitimately had a problem. Oh. And I'm not going to name any names. People mm-hmm. can look on Twitter and see who was discrediting this user that was correct. And so then uh, that person got a failure in their wallet. This transaction's too big. And that's because their UTXO Mm. selection was wrong and it didn't understand what the max standard transaction size limit was for the network that they were operating at. These are things the wallet should have taken care of for you. However, they're also really edge Mm. case. So where do we get a library that like, we'll just select UTXOs. And if you can't satisfy it says, sorry, this transaction would be too big and throws the right error. So that the developers don't have to worry about these edge cases anymore. Because, yeah, to the user, the shit is broken. The the chain is broken. I just got a $12 fee and it's telling me I can't send the transaction. That's about as broken as your wallet can be, right? Um, And a lot of that is because the libraries just aren't as mature as they should be. Now, the solution for that user was pretty straightforward. Make some smaller transactions that use less UTXOs. Eventually, it's going to coin select correctly if you do lower value transactions. And the overall fee for the transaction won't actually go up, but it will be high because you have all these tiny little dust UTXOs. And that's not usually Mm. what happens. But we have to be really um, diligent within the community to recognize when something's actually broken and not snap on people and tell them that it's not broken or that they're fudding because there is FUD. There's people that say all sorts of stuff, but there are legitimate problems. And if we tell a user that their legitimate problem is not real, then that's how you lose the community, right? Because they want to know that they're being listened to. That guy thought his 150 bucks from noise cash was trapped, that he had just lost a bunch of money. That's scary Mm. for a user and we should be compassionate about them, especially if we're going to be servicing users in the third world or areas that have a lower, you know, standard of living, because for them, even if they have $5 trapped, that could be their rent. That could be their, their food and their bills. So we can't say like, oh, well, that's only five bucks. Yeah, it's only five bucks to someone that has a lot of money. But the sliding scale is dramatically different for the different user classes. Hmm. Yeah, it's like I was discussing um, BTC, uh, you know, this tweet from Michael Saylor uh, today about how, uh, you know, people should use BTC to save so that they can, you know, later achieve their hopes and aspirations. And I said, well, how are they going to do that if they can't spend it? (laughs) And somebody said, oh, no, they'll they'll borrow They'll borrow against it, right? They'll leverage it to get something that they can spend. No, it's and, worse. And uh, and I said, 
And I said, well, what about the fees? You got to move it and all this stuff. And they're like, well, if twenty, if a twenty dollar, first he said fees aren't a big deal, and then I showed him BitcoinFees.cash, and he's like, "Well, if you can't afford a twenty dollar fee, I don't know what you're doing here, anyway." I was like, well, pal, five billion people in the world are not as rich as you and I. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's a, it's a big deal for them. They may not be saving, you know, twenty thousand or two hundred thousand dollars like you. They might be just saving fifty or a hundred bucks, and and that that's a big difference, you know. So. So yeah. he, unfortunately, the incentives in this world are very wrong. So I'm going to describe you an incentive system. I'm going to tell. I'm going to ask you, as a straw man, do you think this is right? Okay. So he's saying he doesn't okay. mind twenty dollar fees. Let's just take that at face value. Twenty dollar fees. Let's graph out all the UTXOs on the Bitcoin network, and let's figure out how many UTXOs are in Bitcoin that currently are less than twenty dollars, because that's what he's advocating burning. Because that all those UTXOs oh. will no longer be spendable because the fee to spend them will be greater than the value of the UTXO. So let's chop off 15% of the supply, maybe 20% of the supply, which is everyone that stacked sats that have UTXOs less than 20 bucks. Now, that's actually in his benefit that those people all get robbed. Because burning all those coins means his coins are worth more because he has larger UTXOs. Yes. This points out that Bitcoin A is completely not fungible. The amount of money a UTXO is holding directly impacts its actual performance on the network. So if your UTXO is less than the fee, your UTXO is worthless, you have no money. And if it's a higher than the fee, then it's worth money. So effectively, there's this cliff where the value completely disappears. And so what Michael Saylor is saying when he says that is, oh, well, high fees are OK. So we're cool with burning the, all the supply of UTXOs less than 20 bucks. And maybe he's advocating for thousand dollar fees. Right. That means he actually wants to burn every UTXO worth less than a thousand bucks, which would be like 40 percent of the supply. That would increase his holdings because nobody else could sell their Bitcoin because they couldn't send it to an exchange without losing all the value of the fucking Bitcoin. So their argument is just completely wrong. And if someone showed them a chart of UTXO utilization versus fees and the backward incentive of wanting to rob all of the people that have low amounts of Bitcoin to make their heavy bags worth more then that's what they want to do. And I have no part of that, but that's what they want to do. That's fine. That's the incentive they are advocating. And it's fine if they want to do that and rob a bunch of people for their own wealth, but it doesn't surprise me. What an incredibly insightful observation and analysis. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it like that before. And you know, in the past, like people were like, what if someday people want to print more than 21 million Bitcoins? Or, hey, what if this mining pool gets 75% of hash and, you know, they could 51% attack us? This is a new attack vector. Absolutely. Raise fees so much that you, you yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then eventually the only people that can afford the fee are the people that are your custodian because they'll have to aggregate the fees for multiple customers for the fee to even be reasonable. So what will happen is eventually if fees skyrocket, then people will push towards layer two solutions. But if layer one is so broken that it costs you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to transact, then those layer two solutions can charge you less than that because they know you're screwed if you don't use them. So then you're gonna get, have Square and Square is gonna be like, yeah, we have Lightning Network but it's gonna be running on their servers. And then you're gonna get an API with Square because you can't actually send it on chain to them. You can't do anything with them, really. So you're gonna buy it from them. They're gonna put it on their own channel and it's not gonna be on your key. And then you're gonna pay for the benefit of moving your money, not really your money because it's their key, but your allocated part of their money and then they're going to move the funds on their channels for you so that they can aggregate the fees they get from their customers to offset the cost of being able to open and close channels that might cost a thousand bucks or a hundred bucks to open, which no end user is ever going to do. And this is the, the, even if the lightning network technically works, like it moves value and moves stuff around. Okay. Is it still okay that it is, you never have your keys anymore? And that now all these lightning hot wallets have hot keys in them for large balances. 
And now I'm dependent on a third party because now my money's with Square. It's not with the Bitcoin network because I don't have the key. So if Square decides to censor me, then I've just lost my money, even though I'm using Bitcoin, which is exactly the problem I thought we were trying to solve and not have be possible anymore. So I see the incentives on Lightning like really great for service providers and really great for the existing financial elite and very, very poor for everybody else. That's not the Bitcoin I signed up for. That's just not the one that I, I was interested in. I wanted global cash for the world that everyone could transact. And this is as far from that mission as it possibly could be. And if you look at the price pumps that have happened, it all makes sense. Who's pumping the price right now? Companies and financial institutions are pumping the Bitcoin price. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. higher that price goes, the worse the user experience goes for everybody that needs to use the network. And if you think they don't know that, then you're foolish because they do know that. That's why Bitcoin is worth so much more than the other coins. They want it to look like the most valuable coin, even though it gives the worst user experience of most of the coins. I would argue that, you know, I've been seeing some 200 plus dollar fees on ETH. I don't know that that's much better, to be honest. Um, but the, the, the Bitcoin narrative has literally pivoted completely from empower the poor people on the planet and everyone to be able to transact and even the playing field on people making payments to let's pump the price, let's make it only useful to financial institutions, let's get back to custodial gateways that are going to manage your funds. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought that was what we were getting rid of. Man, you are getting me fired up. <laughs> this is so great. <laughs> I remember when everybody was like, the institutions are coming, the institutions are coming. And, you know, we all thought that would, you know, add weight to what was the original vision. But it turns out that it has actually perverted the original vision, you know? Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, the extra money entering the space led to a lot of people that didn't really care about monetary theory that were only looking for price goes up. Those people that are only looking for price goes up may not be able to do the technical analysis to see where the trends go, not just technically, but economically. And they're going to be very rabid about their position because there's money involved. So you take random Joe on the street, right? And you have him invest $10,000 in something. He's going to be commenting about it a lot all the time, even when he doesn't know anything about it because he's invested and his bags are holding whatever it is. So he feels the need to defend his investment on Twitter or wherever it is, because that's the investment they made. And that's why diversification is so important. And being able to be kind to the other coins and talk about them more factually rather than just conspiracy theories. But like we can see the economic side effects of some of the policy changes that have happened. You know, if we look at the, the pivot that happened in 2015 ish era of Bitcoin and we look at the economics of it, we have six years of looking at the economics of that. And we have seen a lot of these things come true. And so it's not just conspiracy theory or speculation. It's like, no, empirically, SegWit didn't work. Fees are high still. Full stop. SegWit didn't cause uh, fees to go down and le led to a huge amount of complexity added to Bitcoin that has had very little benefit thus far. That's just a fact. Not many people are using Lightning today. There are a lot of developers working on it, but not many users of Lightning today. And the wallets that work the best are custodial today right now and that's mm -hmm. just the beginning because i actually think that's where they all will go because a non-custodial lightning wallet that costs me a thousand bucks or a hundred bucks to start transacting is a non-sequitur no one is going to do that so i, I just mm -hmm. see like a lot of people don't want to look at how the industry's actually developed and the the bitcoin maximalists bury their head in the sand that we're in a multi-coin world now that's just the truth you look at the top 10 and we have a casino of new cu cu currencies that are happening and qualified dev teams. And now are all, they gonna, all of them going to work? No. Are they going to all find communities? Absolutely not. But Bitcoin has failed big enough that, you know, a bunch of people thought they needed to write their own rather than extend Bitcoin. That's a fact. 
Now, the Bitcoin developers can say they're the best or whatever it is that they want to say about that narrative. But I actually think a lot of these other dev teams are very qualified and very capable and are trying to do something that uh, they think is good for the world. And right now, um, they're doing that because the incentives they see on the other chains, they think they need to build that. So you look at, you know, Cosmos Hub trying to be the interchange of different blockchains. You see Polkadot wanting to be that that right. entity as well. You see multiple chains on Avalanche and trying to do multi-chain, uh, you know, dealings. We see Ethereum and within the e Ethereum ecosystem, tokens and Ethereum get traded all the time. There's tons of projects that are ERC-20 or token based, and they're able to interact with each other very well because they're on the same blockchain. But the moment that you need to bridge it somewhere else, things start to get difficult. Like even a conversion from Ethereum to Bitcoin requires the trusted third party. In most cases, mm. because I can't do it on a DEX because I can't move an Ethereum asset to the Bitcoin chain on a DEX. And so then who else has liquidity to allow me to change from one chain to another? Um, and it can't run as a smart contract because smart contracts don't work multi-blockchain right now. So then you're going to go to Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini or some other exchange, and you're going to exchange your Ethereum for Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or whatever it is. And there, the inter-blockchain solution today is centralized exchanges because they have the liquidity. Well, eventually, people are building the tools now that you're going to be able to move these assets between each other all the time. And that will happen, whether that's in five years or 10 years or two years. Uh, there's no doubt that you're going to be able to trade one asset for another pretty much anywhere trustlessly via some kind of decentralized exchange. So what does that mean about having a maximalist opinion about any of these currencies? Um, they're all going to be interchangeable. Like you could literally be checking out and converting one to another currency for whatever that vendor wants to support, you know, that, that business wants to support. So for me, it's all about user experience, right? We're going to be able to switch between them a lot. I think Bitcoin Cash has a great user experience and more importantly, a focus on merchants. And I think that we're on the right track trying to scale in all possible avenues, not just big blocks. I don't think that people are against second layer solutions. Every argument I said against Lightning does not apply to Lightning if it costs me a cent to open the channel. If it costs me a cent to open the channel, non-custodial Lightning uh, wallets work great. You could open a bunch of channels to all your friends and not worry about being, you know, broke. You could actually create a really nice mesh as long as the layer one fees are still manageable. And so I think that Lightning would work better on Bitcoin Cash, to be perfectly honest. The technology is there. We have covenants to do the locking contracts and all of it would just work better because nobody would have to worry about the fee and low volume trans uh, channels wouldn't have to worry about being able to submit a fraud transaction if the fee levels are too high. So you open a, a lightning channel and you're just playing around with it and you open up a $10 channel and someone robs you. But currently the amount of fees for me to send my challenge transaction are $10. I'm robbed. I've been robbed. I can't challenge them because the fee to challenge them costs more than the channel was worth. Robbed. It doesn't work with right. high fees. So it's, to me, um, it's a, not about layer two bad. It's layer two good as long as layer two has choice and layer one isn't pricing them out and forcing them into a bad layer two solution. Because there's tons of layer two solutions. I work at one. Coinbase is a layer two solution. You can send to email back and forth on Coinbase and it all works out just fine. And so... To me, layer two is not a, a dirty word. Forced layer two is a dirty word, right? So like if I want to use other channels, I want to use some other trusted third party, I can choose to do that. And that's great. It's when I can't choose anymore, when my choice has been economically priced out for me able to do an action. That's when things are really broken to me. It's like, wait a minute. So like I can't really be custodial, uh, non-custodial, because if I try to do this non-custodial wallet, then I'm going to need to open up like three or four different channels and they're going to cost me 25 bucks each. And I don't have that money. That's economically being forced mm. into a bad position. Um, and these things are avoidable. Hmm. 
Yeah, I've been think I've been saying to some people that I think centralized exchanges are um, they have a time limit on them at this point. Like I think the future is this. You know what you just said. Um, well, there's how, one how far away? Like you said, maybe it's two, five, ten years. One feature a DEX can't provide you. It'll never inter- uh, interact that? with a fiat entity without a trusted party. Because it has to go by the same rules mm. that our existing fiat economy has to, to work with. So their AML, KYC, government regulation, all of that stuff requires them to have a business relationship that they can terminate with any entity that they're doing business with. So I actually don't think centralized exchanges go away. I think their purpose changes. So the centralized exchange will change from managing all your digital assets and your banking integration to really just being the facilitator in and out of fiat. So the dis- the centralized exchanges will probably take over the crypto space and people that build the best tooling there will cause charge service fees and extra stuff because tooling and service stuff does cost money. And so I think people will figure out ways to monetize these decentralized exchanges. Um, and we see a lot of cool stuff happening with one inch and uni and, you know, the, I'm really glad that there's pre, uh, forward progress, but there's zero chance that Bank of America is going to let you send a wire transfer to a blockchain that automatically converts it to, you know, some digital asset because the regulations will be too tight there. I don't think, I think the way they regulate the crypto space is through the in and out of fiat. So they make sure that you have to pay taxes in U.S. dollars in the U.S. They make sure that you need U.S. dollars for all of these specific things. And then they're going to make sure that anytime you're going in or out of those U.S. dollars, that they analyze as much as they can about that behavior. Where did you get that crypto that you are now exchanging for U.S. dollars? Where did you get those U.S. dollars that now you're buying crypto with it? And then where are you sending that crypto? And then they're going to lose track of it because the it will eventually, but the parts they can track, they're going to. And the one key part that they're always going to be able to track is through the banks and the ledger updates that would need to happen from the bank. And I don't see that being decentralized uh, because of just the, the compliance burden that is needed. So you're right. I think the role of exchange changes. And I think that, you know, it starts to pivot in a very big way once enough people are transacting day to day with crypto. Um, But we're far from that. Like right now we're less than 1% crypto exposure and that's not using every day. That's like 1% someone has touched it or has heard about it. Um, We're far from that point. But that's why I'm very comfortable with where I'm at at Coinbase is I do think we need regulated exchanges. When I'm sending someone a large amount of money. I want to know that the person I'm sending that money to is trustworthy and that I can talk to the Better Business Bureau if I have an issue or like normal business stuff that I get with working with my exchange. And I want to know that my bank is able to talk to that organization as well if there is any issues, right? So like a transfer didn't make it and they're trying to figure out what happened. You don't want any of those problems to exist in a decentralized space because your money will just be gone. Like the, the where's the support? Where's where is all of this extra benefit that you're going to get? So I see it as a slow transition, and I do agree that the DEXs will continue to get better. Right now, the DEXs are really mm-hmm. kind of tied to their own platform. We see bridges, but the bridges are expensive and technically difficult to um, for beginning users. So like I saw what Mm -hmm. the Pangolin Dex on Ava looks pretty cool, but to move your Ethereum tokens over there was costing a lot of money. And yes, it was on the Ethereum side. It doesn't make it any less of a problem that it costs 300 bucks to move your stuff to this other chain. It's still 300 bucks. It doesn't matter where it came from. Like at the end of the day, somebody just wants to know that they can trade their coins and hopefully make some money is what they're trying to do. Um, And... So I I, I see the exchange as being that regulated entity between your fiat and your crypto. I don't see that changing anywhere near the near in the near future. And I think that a lot of the DEXs need work for cross chain. They're not quite there yet. Like Ethereum, if you're in ETH and you're using ERC 20s, the DEXs are really cool. Swap anything. But like recently, I wanted to get a little bit of Bitcoin cash to get to some of the South Sudanese folks. And I had... Uh, some crappy mm-hmm. hex that had been airdropped to me. 
So I was like, well, this is perfect. I need to send some money to South Sudanese. I don't care about Hex. I'm going to sell this. <laughs> but to sell it was a journey, right? So like, okay, I opened my MetaMask and I unstake this Hex that I got for free. I would never buy this crap, right? So I got it for free. It cost $200 to just run the unstake transaction. 200 bucks gone out of my oh, – and great. then I was like, okay, well, now it's unstaked. Now I need to move this to Coinbase Wallet, which is my non-custodial ETH wallet. So I send it over there, $6 fee, much more reasonable than the $200 I'd been hit with. But just to send the token was 6 bucks. Then I got it to my wallet, and then mm. I exchanged it with Uniswap to ETH. Because I just wanted to get some Ethereum. I wanted. To, uh, I figured ETH is easy to move around or whatever. I felt more comfortable there. So I converted to ETH. Mm -hmm. And that costs you know, $10 for the matchmaking transaction. And then another $60 to actually transfer to ETH. And this was like two days ago. This is recent, right? So then now I have ETH. And I'm like, okay, now I need to get from ETH to Bitcoin Cash. And there's not many places to do that. So I send my ETH over to Coinbase. And I swap it for Bitcoin Cash. And actually, that was the lowest fee operation of the whole thing. Coinbase <laughs> took less fees than anything else that I had touched in the decentralized area. Got my Bitcoin Cash and then shot that over to South Sudan for some stuff that we were doing out there. But that's crazy. Most people, like if it wasn't free yeah. money I was dealing with, like the hex was just garbage, right? Like I didn't care about it. I didn't care if I lost some money on that. But... The truth is, is that most mm. people would care that they got taxed over $250 to just try to move some money around. That's nuts. So the yeah. DEXs need some love and they need better integrations with some of the other blockchains. <laughs> and they are far from, you know, being the silver bullet with their current fee rates. Hmm. So you said you see uh, centralized exchanges still having a role, you know, being fiat on off ramps. What about peer to peer uh, exchanges like local.bitcoin.com, localcryptos.com? Love it, but there's because some serious like here in the developing on. world, we, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the issue well, here, is, see, for example, here the, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, go for it. I was just going to say here in Colombia, like we haven't been able to get a decent exchange. And just recently, like all these exchanges partnered with Colombian banks in order to just get into a sandbox to test some stuff for a year. And then maybe, you know, so I think regulatory approvals in the developing world are quite complex for the centralized exchanges. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's why Coinbase isn't in more countries. Like, trust me, Coinbase makes money by enabling trades and providing good service to our users to make trades fast and uh, offer as many coins as we think we can get regulatory approval for to make sure that you're working at least with a safer set of assets, right? There's a lot of crap out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff on every exchange that I don't like. But they're safer than the 5,000 you see on CoinMarketCap. So you get this filtered list, um, and we would love to do business in all those countries. But you're right. The regulatory burdens are, you know, make it so we have to really look at it one country at a time. And we want to be everywhere. We want the global financial system, and we want to be able to enable that. And we've added a lot more around, like, locale gating. Uh, so we can offer an asset in one region but not another region to really, like, open up this process for people to be able to do these trades. And I think that there's still a lot of use cases for um, custody as well. So a lot of people want to demonize mm. not your keys, not your coins. I know lots of people that lost their keys because they thought, not my keys, not my coins. And now they got no coins. They've got no coins. <laughs> so like it doesn't always work <laughs> out so great. Um, and for instance, my mom, mm. I set her up with a Coinbase account. My mom has no business writing down 12 words or doing any of that stuff, but she can do my coin, her Coinbase account. She can go look at her balances. She's got a nice little mobile app. It works for her. And she doesn't need to know all the complexity. Mm. And to me, I think that's an okay trade-off. You know, like I think she's low risk. She's an older woman dabbling in crypto because her son's in it. You know, uh, this isn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think that some people need custody. Like if someone wants to hold six, seven digits of a cryptocurrency, then, you know, there's sometimes where a hardware wallet might be enough, right? You know, you're holding five figures of crypto. Hardware wallet, pretty good. You know, six digits of crypto. Hardware wallet might be pretty good, you know? Seven or eight digits of crypto. You're probably looking at more than a hardware wallet. 
you know, you have your hardware wallet and then you probably have like a safety deposit box or like a hidden thing with your phrase, something going on. But it starts getting a lot more complicated yeah. and the higher that number is, especially if you're vocal in the crypto space, people might know you have that money. And, you know, if mm. your ledger's in your house, that's a robbery target. There's like lots of stuff that is questionable about always holding your own keys. And especially for institutions that don't necessarily, ha they, they need a process and they don't want a lot of people having access to key material. So they might want a custodian that is managing their assets for them and has access controls on their team and limits on how much they can pull from their accounts. They're like actual good use cases for that. And I think that that's okay. Now, the key is, is that people should know about the difference and what trade-offs they're making. Yes, I want to hold stuff on my own keys. Yep, I like doing that. I'm an engineer. I don't keep a lot of stuff on exchanges. I prefer to do that. But that doesn't mean that I need to push that on everybody else. And I think that it's the key is the, the information as to what the difference is and what your risk profile is and, um, and what kind of business you're doing. If you're in a gray area business, right, in the United States, and you're dealing with a centralized exchange for your money, that could be very dangerous because they could turn you off. You're in a gray market business. You know, are you in the porn business? Maybe mm -hmm. they'll turn you off. It could happen, right? Um, and there's a lot of stuff where a custodian is not a good solution. But if you run a sandwich shop and you're trying to do sell sandwiches, you sell like pastrami's and stuff, like, dude, they're not shutting your account off. Nobody's caring about your account. And like, you can have your Coinbase account and have some funds there. And it's not going to be a thing. Like you have a legit business with normal revenue, normal books, all that stuff. And you just need someone to help you out. Just like, and I think that's fine. Hmm. Yeah, we, we uh, have onboarded thousands of people here in Latin America, and it's a recurring problem. You know, even though we train people to write down, we give them a little card and they write down their phrase and we suggest they use other means, for example, uh, lastpass.com. Um, still, we get so many people who are like, oh, I wiped my phone and I reinstalled it and my money was gone. You know, they, yep. they haven't quite integrated the paradigm yet, you know. And so, like, I th I'm thinking about maybe trying, uh, there are those guys, Sato Chip, you know, that make the little yeah. cards, you know, maybe th that, those are a solution, you know, for the developing world. Yeah, so um, the developing world, I wish yeah, local.bitcoin.com worked better. But th to be honest, you have to, to pinpoint mm -hmm. where the pain actually is. So say that I'm buying crypto from lo local Bitcoin, right? I have no risk. Once I get the crypto, I've got the crypto. The person taking 100% of the risk on that trade is the other end of the trade, depending on what mechanism I'm giving them, uh, you know, fiat. So if I'm giving them an ACH, they know that I can reverse that within 60 to 90 days, which means that like I could get the crypto and immediately reverse it. And that person on the other end is just going to be screwed. That's the reality. Uh, you could do <clears throat> only final payment uh, methods over fiat, like a wire transfer. But wire transfers are not available everywhere and they're expensive. Sometimes the wire transfer costs 30 bucks or something like that to wire money, which is a lot for the developing world. And the, all of the complexities mm. that come to with peer to peer transfers, unfortunately, are from the reversals that happen on the fiat side. There's never risk except mm. in the Bitcoin cash. Got the Bitcoin cash. I have the Bitcoin cash. We're done. But uh, so the problem is, is that localbitcoin.com allows you to use any payment methods. So you have to be well versed in the reversal procedures of the fiat systems that exist to know whether or not you could get robbed. And this isn't really highlighted mm. as well as it could be. And if they could separate it out, it's like, yeah, so I want to buy X amount of crypto and I'm willing to pay in this payment method. And I know it's not reversible. So like both sides have this irreversibility guarantee then the peer-to-peer -peer stuff works great. Problem is, is that less than 5% of the transactions are actually those. Most of them are through things that can be reversed. Puts a huge uh, risk on users that are trying to cash out to their local currency because of these reversals and the amount of fraud that could occur without having an uh, uh, identification of the person you're doing business with. So that anonymity is great in one respect, but really bad in another because there's no, um, like, they're not culpable of the, of, of the, the issues that occur.
right? Like you can't really complain mm. when they've reversed their transfer. You don't really know who they are. And by the time both sides have agreed that the transfer is initiated, it's like, yes, both sides say yes. And the transfer happens non-custodially, great. But then one person gets robbed right afterwards. And I don't know how to fix that. Mm. Um, And it's really about what are the most reliable existing fiat mechanisms that you don't get robbed. Because it's really the fiat rails that are robbing you every single time you get robbed from a local.bitcoin.com transaction. Because the crypto side, you can wait for confirmations and like everything's fine. Like you have the crypto, they can't take it. Um, And that's really complicated because I want those solutions to exist. But the truth is, is that these types of anonymous solutions are extremely dangerous. So they see some seller that's been selling Bitcoin a lot or Bitcoin cash or whatever asset. Then they offer to buy some and some places even offer to do it in person, right? Yeah, I'll go buy some in person. Well, they know you did all these other trades that you have more crypto and they'll hurt you. They will do stuff to you, mm. like if you meet them in person. So meeting in person is really dangerous unless you know the other person. I wouldn't be re- meeting any mm. stranger saying, I have a bunch of crypto. I could trade with you and then like just show <laughs> up somewhere. That's really a bad idea. And we have a lot of stories of local Bitcoin, uh, local Bitcoins where these types of things have happened and they've had to regulate with more KYC specifically because people got hurt. Like it wasn't because of nothing. It was because people got screwed on these trades and there was danger. And so they got pressured to add more KYC. That is very reasonable. And people can yell at them and be upset with them all they want. They're literally trying to protect the safety of their users. And some of those anonymous users did get burned. They're not able to do the things as anonymously as they were able to. But the downside of anonymous is that there's no you know, feedback mechanism when something bad is really happening. So I, I, mm. that's my number one concern, George, is how do we get safe fiat to crypto that doesn't have a high fee and can't be reversed? So wires are a little expensive. Um, you know, there's like the Venmos and those types of solutions, but those are regional, not necessarily all over the globe. And I'm not super um, well versed in the South American money markets as to how money moves around. But I'm assuming that most of those are reversible as well, that only some of them would be irreversible. And so having material as to what are the irreversible fiat networks and the ones that are safe to use on local.bitcoin.com would be really valuable so that when they go there, they can filter it and say, "Okay, I'm not taking anything that can be charged back. Hmm. Yeah, those, that's a really interesting observation. Um, though I have to say that I've used um, localbitcoins.com. I mean, I don't use it anymore. I haven't used it for a year, but I did use it from about maybe 2015, you know, here and there. Um, I did some trades and I, I, I've also used local.bitcoin.com, local cryptos, and I've, I've never been robbed. So literally. that's fantastic. And if you're doing stuff with people with a high reputation, then you could do okay. But it, that, that's my number one fear about mm. some of these types of um, uh, anything that's touching the fiat ecosystem. Decentralized exchanges and uh, exchanges that are just dealing within one blockchain, that stuff's really safe. It's the fiat that is, and it's also one of the big un- misunderstandings about Coinbase is they're always like, hey, I just sent you money and I bought this crypto. I can't pull all my crypto out. And it's like, yeah, you sent us an ACH. You actually haven't sent us money until I let this clear for 90 days. Like, I don't know that you sent me money. Hmm. You can pretend to send me money, but I don't know I have money for 90 days. You're lucky I'm giving any of it to you right now. And the reason I can give it to you is because of a fraud detection score where we know how much we can deal with profits and losses as because we want you to get your crypto faster. But the money you sent us is not safe. And now you're yelling at us because you sent us Mm. unsafe money and you're expecting me to give you safe money in return immediately. That's crazy. And that's the number one complaint Mm. about Coinbase. It's like, yeah, if you want your crypto immediately, send us a wire transfer and you'll have 100% of your crypto the next day. And there'll be, there won't be a delay because I can't, you can't reverse that. But if you're sending us something that can be reversed, why are you expecting us to give you the full value of it that minute? That's insane. You just don't understand how the networks work. And now you're complaining because of ignorance, I guess, as to how the fraud actually gets perpetuated against exchanges. Hmm. Yeah, I I don't I I didn't I wasn't aware of that distinction, you know, 
uh, between ACH and wire transfer. I mean, we have other things here, but, you know, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. I always thought they were pretty much interchangeable in the U.S. Well, they, so that's yeah, really they, interesting. they feel that way because most of the people you send an ACH to, you have like some contract with, right? Like you're not going to not pay them because they're going to notice. So like if you send an ACH to someone for a bill, right? Well, they're going to contact you if that thing bounces or disappears. <laughs> they're not going to be okay with that. Your power will get turned off or, you know, if your gas will get turned off or something. Yeah. So earlier you were saying that, you know, you, you see this, uh, I think you see the future as kind of multi-coin, right? Because we're going to be able to ex exchange coins simultaneously, instantaneously and whatnot. So what do you see as the role of Bitcoin Cash in that future multi-coin multi world? So I look at it as the payment experiences and the number of coins that a specific vendor may want to support maybe um, a subset of coins. And I think that the, a lot of the onus on the switching between coins will move from a vendor accepting a lot of coins to the wallets auto converting to the coins that the vendor cares about. And I think that Bitcoin Cash has a lot of good properties mm -hmm. that lend itself really well for the payment space and some of the newer uh, tokens and smart contracts that are coming out on Bitcoin Cash. I like that we're not maintaining full state. I, I have to maintain Ethereum nodes that catch basically fire. We have them on the largest instances we can. That that chain is very difficult to scale. Um, and so when I look at Bitcoin Cash, I look at it as a Bitcoin that is still functional. I don't believe Bitcoin is functional if it has high fees. I don't think Bitcoin is functional if I have to tell people to use third party layer two software for it to even be remotely usable. So I just don't, I, I look at it as, you know, we really need a Bitcoin variant that works, that is, is run by um, the community and allows for open source licensing to continue to exist. And so for me, Bitcoin Cash, most of the devs are releasing stuff on the MIT license, except for Xander. He likes to do all his flowy stuff on GPL. But we have open licenses and different types of open licenses for us, for whatever developers are there. I think that's really important. Anyone that has a license that restricts what you can do with the software that was written, I think is going down a bad path. Uh, and I think that eventually people will look at Bitcoin Cash as the Bitcoin that is still functional and um, is something that day to day people can continue to use. It has a really large head start on merchants and merchant adoption. I have I see a lot of excitement about having this decentralized um, group that sees the need to work together, but may not agree about everything. And that's fine. That's that's the that's life. And that's the world. And but uh, not having a dictator that can tell you like this is exactly what's going to happen with the chain all the time, I think is really important from a governance. Uh, it seems like lack of governance, but I actually think that it's really positive for governance to live in that model. Because unfortunately, if you have a strong team of decision makers, those are the people that can be hijacked. And people can say, oh, well, that can't happen. And it's like, no, actually it can. And it can be really discreet and very effective. <laughs> and so if you have five people that are making all the choices on your chain, well, that's five people that need to be touched and you're, you're completely compromised. If you have different dev teams scattered over different countries that all uh, talk about everything together and try to provide merit-based uh, arguments and use case-based arguments on what needs to be extended or changed, and the status quo for changes is no changes, like what's happening on this next hard fork. I think that is actually the healthiest thing to do. I think people are extremely arrogant if they think they can run a project as a dictator and that all of the uh, market forces that would want to manipulate that project would not be able to impact them. I think that is incredibly arrogant. And I do not think that that is something that is uh, based in reality. I think that is based in ego and uh, is a problem with a lot of these other chains is that um, they're centralized entities looking to decentralize their centralized entity. Um, and I, I don't like that. And I think that coin issuance is also a really important thing as well. I think that Bitcoin had a fair issuance. Some people decided not to mine. They didn't want to participate early. That's fine. But no one got free Bitcoin. Every Bitcoin that was ever gotten was mined. It was mined by someone and that network was open for participants at any time. And some people did get rich. 
because they deserve to because they did the work and other people chose not to. That is a fair distribution to me. Anybody that wanted to get in could have. Bitcoin Cash forking off of that UTXO set, I think, is really important because that fair distribution made it to Bitcoin Cash and rewarded the existing crypto users that had balances, not brand new people that had no skin in the game. So all of a sudden, you know, these coins that want to like mint a billion tokens and then like, I'm keeping 20% for myself. Like, what? Like, sorry, I, I'm just not on board with that. Um, I think the moment you have a foundation, you've put yourself as a, a, put that as the governing agency that is ripe for attack. I don't think that these foundations really work that well. And I think that it's up to the market to build products that are useful, not for the coin vendor to try to do everything. The people that are working on the coin want to provide the primitives and the best possible experience for that coin. That's great. But then it's up to businesses and companies and, you know, game developers and everybody else to build actual value of things that you can do with those assets. And I don't think that the foundation of the coin should have anything to do with that. I believe in free markets. If something is a good network and someone wants to build a cool product, they should just go build a fucking cool product. And if they need cool and if they need investment, then they should be doing what everybody else does. Put together your pitch deck, go get yourself some investors and go tell them how you're going to make their money back and build some profitable businesses on the chain. But that really has nothing to do with the developers of the chain directly. If there are features that are needed for these applications, well, then those people are going to mention it. But the truth is, is that, you know, not every feature is going to make it in a decentralized network. I can't promise that every business that needs every feature is going to get it. That's just not realistic. Now, if there are features that make sense and can help other businesses and can be described through merit as to why they should be there, then, yeah, those hopefully will make it based on their merit into the chain at some point. But and so I see that today, right? Like I see the transaction chaining limit. A lot of us wanted to remove it. I'm a, a big fan of removing it completely. And what happened is businesses mm -hmm. started to feel the pain. They let the developers know. They said, hey, guys, this is really affecting our business. We can't do the following actions. And we think we could grow you know, uh, the usage quite a bit if we could fix this issue. And what we saw is the dev team that said no to that get booted. The meritocracy wasn't there. Right. It was, it was just like, oh, well, you're going to say no to the things that most of the key businesses want. That is something that technically should be possible. And you're going to fight and say that, you know, better than all the other businesses and you're not going to have a merit based debate about it. Well, that that's not the ethos of this coin. And so I think that we've already seen the adjustments being made where dictatorial behavior is just not a, a, not allowed. And the, the moment that they left, now we see forward progress. The chain limits already been uh, removed in BU. It's being adjusted in BCHN. BCHD never had a chain limit. So uh, we, we were the outsider. We never, uh, we never cared how long your transaction chains were. And we want to just coordinate that we're having similar values now to make sure that we have a consistent chain. Um, I think that's how things should be done. It should be based on business and marketing need described and then the developers should be able to look at it and if six different dev teams look at one issue and they're like yeah this kind of makes sense to change that's a pretty good first pass on like let's change it now at the end of the day people can also choose not to run the chain so if those devs make the bad choice right they add features that people don't so let work. me get a point in here that is so abc was not opposed to um to raising the tra chain transaction limit it's just that the argument was that the changes required would m complicate uh backporting from uh bitcoin core and thus raise the ongoing costs of uh maintaining uh the node right yep so yeah so do no, you, th do you, th do you argument. think do you think these chain do you think that argument is valid um yes and no Yes, if you want to be backporting something from a coin that has a completely different set of um, uh, different set of a different goal set. So like right now, Bitcoin wants small blocks, high fees and is writing code for that. So why are we copying that code exactly? That's like exactly the opposite thing that we actually well, want on Bitcoin Cash. So their mempool code in Bitcoin does not reflect what we want to accomplish. 
So I think backporting stuff that we don't want to do seems stupid. To be perfectly blunt, well, the, arg- like their, the argument was their arg- the argument was that we, that there would be additional cost if we de- decided to diverge uh, the code base from core. Um, yeah, I would argue that that, that should have been a planned cost from day one. Like the fact that we were so reliant on core changes this whole time, I think was a miserable failure. To be honest, mm. the mempool should have been one of the first things that was looked at as to why the behavior should be different. The incentives are different. So if we're trying to get uh, larger blocks with one sat byte fees, then the only child pays for parent that we really care about is like a chain depth of one. There's never going to be a chain depth of more than one child pays for parent transaction, period, on Bitcoin Cash for a particular transaction pretty much ever unless the chain completely is falling over. So mm. in that case, I think that it's it's ridiculous. And some of the backports that I read, they just were stuff that we just didn't care about. They did those backports because they were needed for even future changes. So they weren't taking in mm. consideration the amount of effort to do backports we absolutely didn't need just to get the changes in so that future backports would be able to merge nicer. Not only that, mm. ABC refactored the syntax of a majority of their code, which made that those backports significantly harder from day one anyways. So if they mm. didn't want to diverge much from core, they shouldn't have set up all new code guidelines and rewritten all the style of the entire code base that made all the backports more difficult. Mm. So yeah, I definitely I, I felt uh, that there was a lot of bureaucracy in ABC. There was an excessive amount of bureaucracy and. Yeah. Yes. Anal and retentiveness like around they, the, the code. The answer was always no. It was always no, this is yeah. too difficult or too long or not enough budget. But then other teams were working around it and trying to come up with solutions. And to me, I think that, you know, trying to come up with solutions is really important. And um, mm-hmm. I, I just didn't feel like they were working with everybody on those solutions. And mm-hmm. I'm actually no, a fan of removing child pays for parent um, because I don't think we actually need it. And if someone sends a very, very low fee transaction. That's on them. That's that's their fault. Um, and the fees are already low enough and predictable enough and easy enough to program for that I'm not really worried about that user. And so mm. the, the, the 50 change transaction limit affected a lot of apps. It wasn't just one app that needed it. And so I, I, I really see... Um, a future where this new group of developers really is on the right path, where it's like, yes, for uh, the next upgrade where there's not going to be consensus changes, let's try to coordinate so that we can get the right chain transaction limit for everybody. And let's try to coordinate what that can be. And there's been some back and forth. Some people want just a very high limit. Some people want no limit. Some want like it just based off of how much mempool RAM you have. Uh, But everybody's talking about it in uh and trying to get it solved and that's the piece that i always found was missing before was like people would talk about it and then it would just go nowhere unless abc decided Mm -hmm. to work on it that's what happened with double spend proofs as well double spend proofs uh amari didn't like them he thinks they're worthless so he didn't work on them Mm -hmm. and we didn't see them when abc was the lead node the moment that uh you know abc was working on something else BU's got it implemented. Flowey's got it implemented. We have a PR for BCHD that has it implemented. We actually care about, uh, you know, forward progress on some of these things, even if there are still some edge cases that need to be worked out. But double spend proofs fix several of the different double spend vectors. It doesn't fix a minor assisted double spend. That's the one thing it doesn't fix. There are other incentives that mm-hmm. make it so that a miner doesn't want a minor direct double spend. That's uh, so um, I I like incremental progress. And I think that um, Bitcoin Cash tried to do perfect became the enemy of good uh, in many ways. And uh, I want to get back to, you know, consistent forward progress. That's just good. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, this has been a really interesting conversation. You dropped a lot of really great uh, knowledge and information and uh, insights here, Josh. Uh, Really, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks for generosity with your time. Um, Our hour, we're a little bit over uh, our hour. So uh, do you want to add any final words, let people know where to find you, uh, anything uh, you want help with? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I would love to, there's a couple of um, open tickets on BCHD. I'm always looking for additional Golang developers that want to work on a full node. Happy to get you trained up on the code base, walk through code with you. But there are a couple of like nagging things that we really want to get done on BCHD that we could use some additional dev um, horsepower on. And that would be really nice. And you can find me on Twitter at ZQuestZ. I'm also ZQuestZ on noise.cache which I've been using a lot. And yeah, if you guys have questions about, you know, the stuff I work on or anything like that, feel free to shoot. I'm really um, positive about Bitcoin Cash as of recently. I think that we've really turned um, a difficult corner and that that corner um, ha is starting to pay off now. Uh, I think people are more incentivized to join the initiative now. I think that we see new proponents coming in to build cool new technology. And I, I really think that uh, 2021 is going to be a really interesting year for cryptocurrencies in general. Uh, we're going to see some additional new projects that I've seen uh, sneak peeks of that I think are actually really cool in space, stuff that we can learn from. And um, yeah, this is just the beginning. We have a free market of cryptocurrencies now. Now it's for the free market to decide which ones actually are the most valuable. Cool. All right, Josh Ellithorpe of Coinbase and BCHD, thanks, and let's keep building Bitcoin Cash. Absolutely. You have a wonderful afternoon.